So, we had ourselves the proverbial rumble in the jungle this past Saturday. Yeah, the fair Stephanie takes on the big bad atheist, the baddest hombre atheist in town, Richard Carrier. The skeptic skeptic. Homeboy so skeptical you tell him the grass is green? He'll say, provide your evidence for that fact, or I don't believe you. Let me see your peer-reviewed papers. I don't have any. Well, then it's, I don't accept your premise. That's how skeptical he is. Now, for the analogy at hand, the rumble in the jungle, I guess uh, in the actual rumble in the jungle, George Foreman was the reigning heavyweight champion, undefeated. So I guess that would be Richard Carrier, which means Stephanie was Muhammad Ali. Yes, Stephanie, the greatest of all time. You go, girl. You go. So what happened? Well, contrary to the atheist spinmeister, after show spinmeisters, um, I tried to be as fair-minded as possible. I know Stephanie kind of well, but I tried to watch it with an open mind and tried to assess what actually happened. And here is the real lowdown, people. Honestly, it was a draw. All of you atheists and your spin meistering after the fact, to the contrary, you showed up to watch a bloodbath that just did not occur. It just did not. No, to be perfectly honest, you know, if you were scoring it on points, maybe you'd give Richard Carrier a slight edge on the points, maybe 52 to 48, but effectively a draw. And how these things break down, these type of debates, you know, you got your partisan camps. All the atheists are going to say, yeah, Richard Carrier won, of course, of course. Oh, he killed her. Oh, he killed her. No, he really didn't. <laughs> no, he really didn't. And all the Christians are going to say, Stephanie won. Oh, Richard Carrier, you know, he was talking gobbledygook. But he really wasn't either. Truth be told, he, you know, Stephanie, Stephanie them. And if you've watched Stephanie in the past, she definitely them. She stuck to her talking points, and she says her talking points. She presents them clearly and concisely, and she presents it with a smile. Didn't get rattled at all. Did she get out logic? Did she? Did her her talking points get broken down in front of us? No, not really. If you're an atheist, you kind of think that because you don't agree with the talking points that she was presenting. So of course you walk away from the table, go, "Oh my God, he killed her!" Because the stuff that she is presenting as an argument, you don't agree with. But if you are scoring it as a partisan contest, let's say this was, you know, a political debate, Democrat versus Republican, we'd both appear in the green room and we'd spin it on my candidate one and my candidate one, the people would, would vote, it would probably be 52 to 48 or something like that. You know, that's pretty darn good. Keep in mind, Richard Carrier is a famous, famous atheist. I've seen him cited in national publications. You know, you can, you can look them up on Wikipedia. So if there's ever a David and Goliath story, this is a David and Goliath story, and, you know, little Stephanie is David. So not only is she Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time, she's also David in the David and Goliath story, and she put her little, she put her little talking points in her slingshot, and she whacked away. No, I guess in this, this particular version of the story, the giant's still alive. Yeah, yeah he, didn't get, he didn't get really wounded either, so... You know, she went up against a giant and lived to tell the tale for another day. Now, the argument about the underlying argument in question. To be perfectly fair to Richard Carrier, um, I kind of agree with almost his entire presentation on morality, his entire assessment. It's sort of a combination of Sam Harris and Kantianism, um, Sam, ha Sam Harris and the moral landscape, um, and I've talked about this on other, on other videos that I've put out. Uh, Sam Harris is essentially correct, and Richard Harris's version of objective morality is essentially correct. And defined on their own terms, if you define morality as well-being of either the individual or the society at large, which is a perfectly fair way to, to, to assess morality, yeah, it's loosely based on consequentialism, but it's a perfectly acceptable way to define morality. The well-being of the individual versus the well-being of the society at large. These behaviors here will produce well-being in an individual and the society at large. These behaviors will produce ruin. We can objectively decide these behaviors are good and right and true and these behaviors are wrong. Period. We can do that. 
Those are what moral facts actually are. And he's correct about it. Now, what Stephanie was trying to do, um, it's kind of a variation on the William Lane Craig argument that she finds highly convincing. It's the, the original premise is as thus. So they both decided objective morals exist. Objective morals exist. In the Craig version, hence, God exists. Now, I say to that, not necessarily. And what Stephanie did by adopt, adopting a version of that is set up a higher bar for herself than, she, than need be in a debate like this. I would have gone with a much more watered-down version. Objective morals exist, which indicates that there probably more than likely is a God than not, or maybe makes it a little more likely there's a God. I would have opted with something a lot easier, a lot softer. Um... You know, it's kind, of what, it's kind of what the variation of what Matt Dillahunty did. And I don't know for a fact that it was Matt Dillahunty who invented the, you know, all atheism means is a lack of belief in God. Well, no, not really. <laughs> it's, that's become the colloquial definition of atheism. And I don't know if it was Matt Dillahunty who, who made that colloquial definition, but I'm pretty sure it was he who popularized it. You know, all atheism means is a lack of belief in God. Well, no, not really. That's become the colloquial definition of atheism. But most of the atheists I interact with and most of the atheists listening to this are hard atheists who actually believe affirmatively there isn't a God. Bang! They're not agnostic about it. There, there ain't no God. But they have adopted the colloquial definition. Why? Because these are defending debate, duh. <laughs> you can't really defend him. That's why he did it. It's kind of very smart. So in the future, we the Christians would be better served in debates like these to, to, to adopt a more defensible position intellectually. Stephanie's position is defendable, and the reason why she, def she chose it is because she finds it. See, the reason why you atheists don't like her talking points is you don't find them convincing. The reason why Stephanie sticks on her same talking points, and if you've dealt with Stephanie, you know she reiterates the same, some of the same arguments over and over and over again. You know, ask, ask her about the apostles. <laughs> ask her about why the apostles were so willing to give up their lives. I dare you. Ask her. Ask her. She'll tell you the exact same thing 50 times in a row. Drive you crazy. But in, in politics, is known as staying, staying on message. It's actually a really, really effective debate style. As long as you don't, you know, she, and she doesn't get she doesn't get flustered and rattled, so it's actually a very very good way of presenting yourself in a debate. It's called staying on message. But the reason why she goes back to her same talking points is that she herself finds them powerfully emotionally convincing, emotionally convincing as opposed to logically convincing. The logical argument against her famous talking point is, you know, then the people who blew up the Twin Towers were right because they were willing to die for their beliefs. That's the logical argument. But the emotional argument that she finds powerfully convincing is what she is presenting, or why it's so convincing to her. Now, that can't really be argued against. You either find it convincing or you don't. Ask the Christians. Is it convincing to you that these people saw the risen Christ because they were willing to, to, to give up their lives? And they'll say yes. Ask the atheist? No. <laughs> there you go. But that's neither here nor there. In the case of the debate that we just watched on Saturday, you know, she was presenting her emotionally convincing talking points, and the Christians were going, Amen. Amen, sister. I agree with you. And the atheists were going, No, no way. She's so dumb. <laughs> they said the same thing. <laughs> but... In the final analysis, it was a draw. Richard Carrier did not dismantle those talking points for our, for our pleasure, which is what you tuned in to see. He didn't. So, there you go. You know, you can, you can spin it any way you want after the fact, but I promise you, it, it, the most obvious fact that, it was that, that she walked away completely unscathed is that the, the tweets and the shows that said that she got killed didn't last very long. If she had gotten actually killed, it would have lasted for three days. They'd be going on right now. There'd be 250,000 views on that thing and everybody passing around from atheist to atheist going, look at how she got killed. Nobody's doing that. That tells you all you need to know. Tells you all you need to know. Stephanie took, took on the big champion and walked away unscathed. Barely laid a glove on her, if you ask me. Um, you know, she, 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 
you know, she did her thing. She Stephanie'd him. Stephanie, say her talking point, bang, reboot. Say her talking point, bang, reboot. If you don't like the talking point, you aren't gonna like you aren't gonna like her her thing. But she did it really well and she did it effectively and she did it with a smile. So in the final analysis, you know, the great big bad Richard Carrier, meanest atheist in town, didn't really lay a glove on our little girl. So there you go. Amen.